Ready. Yep. Ready. Record. Now, how often do you look at it to see if it goes black or not? Yes. <laughs> and if it does go black, what do you do? Just come up here at that one. Yes, it is. And if it doesn't say record, you just recycle. Oh, is it going? Yeah. It's going. Okay. So, welcome. Um, I don't. Yeah, we do have a couple of uh, commercials. Good. So. We will be doing this today and next Wednesday. And then on November 20th, Dr. Gary Bierman will be back over there. Uh, I think he's, no, he's going to be in the, in the activity center. And he will be talking about uh, paying attention to the signs of teen suicide. We know that teen suicide is on the rise in America. It's becoming more and more of, a, of, an, of an issue. So he's going to address that. We don't have anything scheduled for December. You guys get to rest your, your brains for a month, and so do I. And then and starting on January the 8th, I'm almost positive, uh, we'll have a flyer, but starting on January the 8th, we will uh, begin a series on the, the major world religions. Okay, so I'm already boning up uh, on Hinduism. <laughs> All right, so we'll talk about Hinduism, we'll talk about Buddhism, we'll talk about uh, Zoroastrianism, and we'll talk about uh, Judaism and Islam, and just kind of give a, a, both, a, both a historic flavor, and then what I try to do when I talk about the world religions is to talk about if you are, let's say, if you are a Jew, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? And what are you doing? Okay? So, you know, what, what, what are you thinking? What, is your, what are your beliefs? What are you feeling? What is your sense of spirituality? What are you doing? What is your sense of morality or your behavior? Okay? So that, that'll be my approach. Yeah, Ken? How, how many days are you... you We're going to do that for five weeks. Five weeks. Yeah. And then in, in March, uh, I'm going to be talking about St. Paul. And I still haven't decided whether to do the general introduction to St. Paul. I'm leaning in that, in that direction, or whether to dive into something like the letter to the Romans. I'm more inclined, with all due de deference to our shrine friends who have heard it before, <laughs> to, to do the uh, introduction. Who is the real Paul? Because the real Paul is... How did that happen? <laughs> it's your daughter. It's your daughter. I just... Yeah. Jamie, leave me alone. I, I, I just put it on... Oh, well. That shows you how much I know about my phone. When, this, is, this is the iPhone 11. Oh, and when I have, yes, indeed, yeah, I know how to, I know how to use about three percent of it. When, when I five G, that the new five G. I guess I, I don't know what five G is. Well, when I, when I brought it, when I brought it home, my daughter said, "I got the same." Said you have the best phone in the family, and you know the least about the technology. I said, "You're right." That's well, true. Exactly. You know three percent. I only know ten percent. Okay, well then I'll, I'll teach you something. Good. <laughs> Mark, if you don't mind, would you repeat the day when January you're going to start? I'm almost positive it's January the 8th. January 8th? 8th, 15th, 22nd, 29th, and then February the 5th, I think it is. But I'll, we'll have a flyer out, Lee, okay? okay. It's, a, right. it's a Wednesday. They're, they're Wednesdays. Yeah, yeah good. In, yeah. In, in March, when we do St. Paul, that's going to be on Thursdays because we have the soup suppers during Lent. So it'll be during Lent. Those will be Thursdays. All right, so let's dive into this. Um, I, I titled this, Is It I, Lord? Because that is what, as somebody has already pointed out, that was the, 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 the question that, that Samuel, young Samuel, posed to Eli when God spoke to him in the night. Yeah, is it I, Lord? And, and of course, yes, it was. And so this is about the prophetic role of the laity in the church today. Uh, each one of us, by our baptism, has a role to play that is in imitation of the prophets. 
So in order to understand what our prophetic role is, I think we need to understand what a prophet is and then see how that plays out in the world today. So I want to start with this uh, quick video. This is like two minutes. So notice the title here. Are these the words of a prophet? First, there's going to be the words of a commercial. <laughs> so your business is finally open for business. This is the no. words of a prophet. Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Seems like business is good. So good you wanted to stay that way. The all-in-one marketing platform from Belgium. <laughs> this Monday, world leaders are going to be gathered here in New York City for the United Nations Climate Action Summit. The eyes of the world will be on them. <coughs> They have a chance to prove that they, too, are united behind the science. They have a chance to take leadership, to prove they actually hear us. Do you think they hear us? We will make them hear us. We have not taken to the streets sacrificing our education for the adults and politicians to take selfies with us and tell us that they really, really admire what we do. We are doing this to wake the leaders up. We are doing this to get them to act. We deserve a safe future. And we demand a safe future. Is that really too much to ask? We are not just some young people skipping school or some adults who are not going to work. We are a wave of change. Together and united, we are unstoppable. We will rise to the challenge. We will hold those who are the most responsible for this crisis accountable. And we will make the world leaders act. We can and we will. And if you belong to that small group of people who feel threatened by us, that we have some very bad news for you. <laughs> I think she's only nine years old. Yeah, she's old. Because Why? this is only the beginning. Okay. So, go to the next slide, please. Oh, yeah, I gotta get out of here. I don't want to hear the next commercial. <laughs> Okay, so those are the words of 16-year-old Greta Thunberg, who is from Sweden and who is, has become an outspoken advocate for doing something about the climate crisis. Uh, and no, I, I chose that little snippet because of the, the tone of her words. She, she spoke to the United Nations Climate Summit and said, it's time for you to stop talking about this and to do something about it. And in that sense, she was, in my mind, she was speaking as a prophet because she's speaking truth to power. And, you know, she's received a lot of criticism, even though she's like, she is 16 years old. She, she started uh, her, her protest when she was 15. She decided to skip school, and she sat outside the Swedish parliament building with a sign that said, I'm skipping school, and Swedish parliament, do something about the climate crisis. And, and she sat there for weeks by herself, and finally, it grew to where there were hundreds of thousands of people who, who joined with her. Okay, so... Uh, I, I use her as a kind of, a, 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 of an introduction. That, that's, that to me is, if you want to uh, kind of understand what, what Isaiah was saying or what Amos was saying, that's, I think that's kind of the way they spoke. You know, kind of like, wake up, do something, right? Okay, so what is a prophet? A pro there are certain characteristics of the prophets. They were, they believed they were called by God. That, the second thing is, they understood deeply 
the covenant that God had made with his people. So the covenant, the Mount Sinai covenant, was a sacred agreement between God and the Israelite people in which God and the Israelites both made promises. So God promised that he would always be with them. He promised them a land. He pro that's why they call it the promised land. He promised that, they, that their progeny would be, that, that, that as a people they would never go away. Uh, and he promised them that, they, that, uh, that their fields would always be fertile, that they would be able to feed themselves and sustain themselves as a people. And the Israelites also made promises. They promised that they would worship only Yahweh. We know how, how good they were at keeping that promise. Not very good. They, 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 they promised to obey God's law the Torah. They promised not to enter into military alliances with foreign nations because, as I mentioned in Isaiah, to enter into a, a, an alliance with a foreign nation is to enter into an alliance with their gods and therefore not, not be faithful only to their own god. And they promised uh, to take care of the poor and the widows and the orphans among them. They promised God that they would take care of God's least ones. Okay? So they understood the covenant. But then they looked around them. They looked at what was going on in, in their immediate world. And they saw that the Israelite people were not living up to the covenant. They were worshiping other gods. They were entering into military alliances. They were not taking care of the poor, the widows, and the or orphans. And they were not practicing Torah. Okay? They were not living up to their end of the bargain, the sacred agreement that they had made with God. Um, and, and, and so they, and this is where they, they, they imitated Greta Thunberg. They called out the sins of the people. They were not shy. They said, like when we studied Amos, for three crimes of Israel and for four, this is, you know, these are your crimes and this is what God is going to do if you don't do something about it, okay? So they called out the sins of the people. When, if you were here for Rory's and my uh, talk last week, uh, we know from Isaiah 58, you know, the, the, the Israelites say, oh, well, we've practiced this fast. Aren't we good? God, don't you like that? And God says, no, not really. No, 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 I don't accept your fast. This is the fast that I choose, he said. This is the fast that I choose. That you free those who are in chains. That you feed those who are hungry. Okay? That you take care of God's, <clears throat> of God's needy, God's little ones. That's what God wants. That's the fast that God desires. So the, the, the prophets always called out the sins of the people. This is where they spoke truth to power. And they were fearless because they would go to the kings. They would go to Ahaz or they would go to Hezekiah and say, Look, guys, you don't change your ways. Something bad is going to happen. And that's, that's the next step. They would say, if, we, if you don't change your ways, something will happen. And we know from history that it did. That the uh, Israelites were uh, conquered by the Assyrians, that the, uh, the Judeans were conquered by the Babylonians, taken into exile. They lost their land. They lost the promised land. Okay? And that was a, a great watershed in their history. So they warned of things to, to, to come for failure to change, and the reception that they received was almost universally negative. It was either... Oh, thanks, Isaiah. I got it. All right, let's keep on doing what we're doing. Or they would ridicule them. Uh, they told, um, they told um, the third um, Zechariah. They told Zechariah, "Get out of here. Stop prophesying here. We don't want to hear it anymore. Go away." <clears throat> because you know the, the message that they were hearing is not something that they wanted to hear. Okay, so those are. That, that's the, the, the profile of the prophet. And as I say those things, I hope that you see that that's the, the profile of 
our prophetic role. This is, this is what God calls us to today. And I'll get into that in, in, in greater detail in just a bit. So, one example of this is Isaiah. I'm not going to read all of that, but, uh, you know, we've been through this. But we know that Isaiah was called by God, okay? And Isaiah, you know, in, uh, in verse 5 says, Woe is me! I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He professes his unworthiness. But God says, I don't care. Your unworthiness doesn't matter to me because I want you to be the bearer of my message. So get over your unworthiness and get out there and start delivering the message. Okay? And Isaiah says, you know, how long? How long do you want me to do this? Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without men and the land is utterly desolate and the Lord removes men far away in exile and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again. So he, God is telling Isaiah, it's not going to end well. Don't expect success. Okay? Your, your, your message is not going to succeed. So you feel unworthy and you're going to fail. Have at it. Okay? <laughs> Isaiah understands the covenant. This, these are the words of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord God who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes with it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. They are a people of the covenant. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Okay? Isaiah deeply understands the covenant, the sacred agreement between God and the Israelites. But Isaiah also understands that the people are not living up to the covenant. How the faithful city has become a harlot. She that was full of justice. Righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not defend the fatherless, and the widow's cause does not come to them. So not only do they understand the covenant, they also understand that the people are not living up to the covenant. Then comes, here's the, the courage of Isaiah. He calls out the sins of the people. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who carry out a plan, but not mine, and who make a league, but not of my spirit, that they may add to sin, who set to go down to Egypt without asking for my counsel to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. In other words, the uh, Israelites were attempting to enter into uh, 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 an alliance, a military alliance with Egypt in order to protect them from the Babylonians. And Isaiah says, don't do that. Don't do that. Rather than enter into a military alliance with other countries, with other nations, and their gods, be faithful to your God, and, your, and our God will protect us. Our God will take care of us. Okay? I've forgotten. When was Isaiah written? Isaiah is in uh, the, seven, the 8th century, 700s. Okay? He is, uh, yeah, because he preaches to Ahaz and he preaches to uh, Hezekiah, who are both in the, in the, in the mid-700s, before the, before the attack of the Assyrians. Okay? That's first Isaiah anyway. <laughs> Didn't the Egyptians make them slaves? Uh, this was after that time, Lee. After that. This is this is about uh, 500 years after that time. Okay. So the the the, uh, uh, the politics had changed quite a bit. Yeah. 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 And they they are their own people by this time. Isaiah warns of punishment for failure to change. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who deal corruptly. 
They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why will you still be smitten that you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But bruises and sores and bleeding wounds, they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Your, countries lie, your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, aliens devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by aliens. Isaiah, you know, his message is not very, very positive here. I mean, it's much of a remember, re, yeah, remember Amos. I mean, Amos never had anything nice to say, right? It, there are times when Isaiah will say, but the Lord will eventually, you know, uh, restore us. Rejected, ignored, persecuted. This happened to Isaiah too. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or comeliness that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. Okay? That, uh, if, if that sounds familiar, that is uh, part of the uh, uh, Good Friday liturgy. Okay? The early church saw these words of the suffering servant and saw Jesus in those words. Now, uh, let's talk about Jesus the prophet. Okay? Not only, well, G Jesus uh, continues in the tradition of the Old Testament prophets. Jesus is a teacher. Jesus is a healer. Jesus is also a prophet. Okay? So he's called by God. And you know, I, I, I read more than I should have in the, in the first one. But here we have Jesus uh, in the synagogue in uh, Nazareth and, and, and talking here about his call. This is him telling the folks in Nazareth what God has called him to do. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is, this is Jesus' call. This is his mission. This is his mission statement. He says this in, this is in the Gospel of Luke. This is right after his baptism. Okay? He has his baptism, and now he's ready to go. Is this when he was 12? And they no, he is a, he's a full-grown full man, 30-ish. Okay, because I remember this time. when you know, the, uh, Joseph and Mary went back, and they, he, he went to the temple, and he was doing, yeah. they were amazed at his... Yeah, his wisdom and his intelligence, yeah, yeah. yes. But yeah. that was not that time. That's not this. Yeah. Just, yeah. But was he speaking, was he actually reading that from the scroll? Yes, he was. He was saying, uh, but whose words were they? I mean, they were the words of Isaiah. So he is saying, I am following, or Luke is saying about him that he is following in the tradition of Isaiah. Didn't the, weren't the people surprised and, and yeah they you know it's yeah their reaction is interesting because at first the story says they looked at him with amazement and then Jesus says something and then they all want to kill him they all want, yeah it, you know if you, if you if you continue reading Luke chapter four you'll see that they look at him with amazement and then he says Help me. I forget exactly the, the, the words that he says to them. But is so, that about where he says uh, you're, it's being fulfilled in your hearing? 
Yeah, yeah. That he, he said that at the end of this little, uh, these two verses. And so, yeah, so their, their amazement turns to anger. And they want to ki they want to kill him, and he kind of slips out, you know, in, in the middle of that. But that was an odd. Spot. I mean, it is a reaction. Isn't it? it is an odd reaction. I, do you do you have do you have Luke four? What does it say after they looked at him with amazement? Jesus says something that really gets their goat. <laughs> talking about the prophet is not without honor except I own. think that's yeah the prophet is not accepted in his own country, country it's, it's his yeah, own I think you're right so they were saying that I am a prophet he's saying I am a prophet and he's saying to the people you guys aren't accepting me he said <clears throat> today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing yes that's what he said yeah he yeah. read he read all that and then said today this what's the next fulfilled. verse Jim and all spoke highly of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They also asked, Isn't this the son of Joseph? And he said to them, Surely you will quote me in this proverb position, cure yourself and say, Do hear in your native place the things that we have heard and were done in Capernaum. And he said, Amen, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own native place. Yeah. 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 And so that kind of, the people of Nazareth kind of took exception to that. <laughs> You know, so they want to, they want to kill him. Yeah. yeah, he. In other words, he is receiving the reception. He re, he's re, he's being received as a prophet, just like the Old Testament prophets. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. Okay. So, second point: Jesus understands the covenant, but now we're talking about a new covenant. Okay, a new covenant, which is the reign of God. And I've talked about the reign of God before. The reign of God is the restoration of God's sovereignty in Jesus' time in Israel. The reign of God for us now is the restoration of God's sovereignty over the entire earth. And what does that comprise of what is God's sovereignty over the earth comprised? For Jesus, it, it had to do with four things. It had to do, and, and all of these four things were designed to counteract the normalcy, the world's normalcy of oppression and violence. We know from history, I know a lot of you have studied history, and you know that history tells a lot about war and slavery and insurrection and violence and all that kind of thing. The reign of God is meant to challenge that and undo the, the normalcy of violence and oppression. And how is it done? It's done in four ways. It's done, first of all, through healing. So Jesus was a, a, a healer. And by healing, he was showing that power, God's power, should be used not to oppress and to, uh, and to divide people, but to heal people. Uh, Jesus uh, often participated in, um, in in meals in which everyone was invited. If you look at the feeding, the story of the feeding of the five thousand, the story of the feeding of the four thousand. Okay, everyone is there: men, women, children, all, all, you know, foreigners, uh, you know, Israelites. Everybody is there. So Jesus is saying, everyone should be invited to the table as a sign of the unity of all people. And, and we should not have those divisions that we normally have about who's acceptable and who's not acceptable and who's better and who's worse and all of that kind of thing. Jesus said, no, all of that is wrong. All of, us, <clears throat> all of us are equal. All of us should dine together at the table. Third, Jesus and his followers wandered. They did not settle down in any place. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What is he trying to say? Is Jesus telling us to sell our homes? I don't think so, and I hope not. I like my home. But what I think Jesus was saying to the people of his time, and what he's saying to us today is, our trust should be in God. Not in our possessions, not in our prestige, not in our success, not in our knowledge, but our trust should be in God. And finally, Jesus preached a message of uh, equality. 
that in the reign of God, uh, all are equal. The, the meals kind of say that, but then so do, so do other of Jesus' actions, like curing Samaritans, like hanging out with tax collectors, like having prostitutes. And look, look at, you know, uh, Roman centurions. Look at the cast of characters that Jesus hung out with. Most of us wouldn't want to be caught dead with people like that, you know? Uh, but those are the people whom Jesus reaches out to first. Lepers, women, children, okay? Those who are deemed unacceptable in the eyes of society. They are first in the reign of God. Does that make sense? You know, if you, if you look at Matthew chapter 25, and that's where, where, the, where it's kind of the, the, the judgment scene. And, uh, and, and, and the sheep, and, you know, the people are divided like sheep and goats. And Jesus says to the people who are, you know, the good ones, so to speak, uh, welcome into my kingdom, the kingdom that's been prepared for you since the beginning of time. And they say, wow, what did we do? And they said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. And when I was sick or in prison, you visited me. And they say, when did we do all of these things. And he says, whenever you did this, whenever you did this to one of my least ones, my least ones, he says, you did it to me. He did not say, it's not translated, you did it for me. He said, you did it to me. And I think that's a very profound difference. That when we feed and clothe and visit, we are, we are doing it to Jesus not for Jesus. It says something very important about, uh, about each and every person in the, on, on this earth, doesn't it? To me it does. Yeah, David? Before you start a new covenant, I have a question on the original. Yes, sir. And I assume that's what God arranged with the Jews coming on in Exodus uh -huh. of Egypt. Uh -huh. And who among the Jews is made responsible for carrying it out? Is this something Aaron was supposed to take care of? Is this something Herod was? Aaron. Aaron. Oh, Aaron. Well, yeah, there were there were different ones. I mean, Moses, and then Aaron, and the judges, and then the kings. So we tribe. And then the priests. Yeah, there was a, but 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 really, um, the understanding of the covenant was something that every person was supposed to have in his or her heart. Okay. So uh, every person was supposed to be, it w w was, was expected to live the covenant. There wasn't a, 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 there wasn't a very hierarchical structure like we see in the, in the Catholic Church. There was, a, there was more of a corporate understanding of what is right and wrong. What was the enforcement or the pro promulgation of the terms, the standards? What, um, How would your average Jew know what he's supposed to do? Oh, I wish Rory were here because she would say oh, there were a hundred different interpretations. You know, look at look look at look at gospel times. So you know, uh, uh, Jesus uh, cures somebody on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees all say, oh, "You're not supposed to do that." You know, and then he cites uh, when when David and his men were walking through the cornfields and pulled you know uh, on, on the Sabbath. He says. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, right? So it was, it was, there was always a lot of gray area in how this was to be interpreted. I mean, there were rules like the, the Jubilee year. In the Jubilee year, you were to cancel the debts of anyone who owed you money. Yeah. Every 50 years, uh, property was supposed to uh, return to its original owner. I don't think they ever did that. You know, if you lived in my house, I'm not giving it back to you. Dude. I'm not doing that. <laughs> what I'm trying to get a handle on is like not control. <laughs> yeah. These what guidelines, like a, we think in terms of the Ten Commandments, what was available to the average Jew to support the covenant? What was available to support it? To follow the dictates. Well, they, they, uh, they, mostly they learned about it and studied it and thought about it in their synagogues. Okay. That, that is where, you know, Judaism has never had, well, at least in the last 2,000 years, any kind of hierarchical structure to it. There is no pope, there's no bishop, there's no nothing like that. 
failure is built in that. But don't have, don't don't say that to them. <laughs> it's it's just a different it's just a different model of leadership. It's a more congregational or denominational style of leadership than a hierarchical style. So what we're saying is the Jewish do not have a hierarchy that they report to. Nope. Every synagogue is on their own. Pretty much. Pretty much. It's a more it's a more charismatic style of leadership than a hierarchical style of leadership. How yeah. do they maintain standards? You know, well, they, standards in this one synagogue wouldn't be the same as... They, well, they, they have traditions. Yeah. And, you know, so, uh, so let's take orthodoxy. That's, that's Rory's uh, denomination. So her, denom her particular congregation, Base Abraham, in University City is Orthodox and like she said the men sit on one side and the women sit on another side but in other ways it's very liberal so if you know if, if, if gay people showed up I don't know how you would know you know but if, you know they, they would be welcomed if people of other faiths came they would be welcomed you see but not all not all um, uh, synagogues act the same way there was just something recently, I think, on 60 Minutes mm -hmm. about uh, the year after the Pittsburgh shooting mm -hmm. at the synagogues. And there were actually like three different synagogues, right? Mm -hmm. And their standards were very, very different. Yes. And they all shared the same building. You know, but their way of interpreting how to respond to this and all that was very different. Three different sects in one building. Yes. yes. Yeah. On the different floors. Mm -hmm. okay. Different floor. Yeah. 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 And the top floor was an effect. Yes, was people on the top floor were not. People that were shot. He never got. He never he got, got that, that far. Floor. Thank mm -hmm. God. So anyway, prophecy. Okay. <laughs> but but good questions. Yeah, Ken. Uh, I was wondering about the uh, uh, how synagogues actually developed and the, and the timeline. You know, did Jesus show up at the synagogue? When you read this stuff, mm -hmm. or was that like a community grouping? Did they have a building set aside for? Yeah, good question. Two, there's two questions there. The synagogue uh, developed after um, after the Babylonian exile. Okay, so like people in Galilee, you know, would not normally make the trip to Jerusalem, even though the Jews in Jerusalem wanted them to. They wanted unified worship. Uh, the synagogue movement, I, let me back up, might have actually begun in Babylon because they didn't have a temple. So they would gather to hear and study the Word of God. Okay? Second question is about Nazareth itself. The, when the archaeologists looked at Nazareth, they found no evidence from the first century of a synagogue building. Nazareth had like 200 people. You know, you could fit all the people of Nazareth in this building. Okay, so what they would do in, in the case where they did not have a, a synagogue building per se is gather in somebody's home. What a surprise then that the early Christians would gather, you guessed it, in somebody's home. Because that's where they would hear the word of God and that's where they would you know, celebrate or re-celebrate the, the Last Supper. Okay, so the New Covenant. He understands the times. The, then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries, the, the things that wear around their waist, wide, and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and be called rabbi by others. So they understand the hypocrisy of of the leadership. Jesus understands that. And he calls it out. Uh, this is Matthew chapter 23. I'm not going to read all this now, but you can read it. But this is, I mean, Jesus does not spare any 
words here. Woe to you, teachers of the law, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You, you travel over land and sea to, to win a single convert. Um, <laughs> here. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. <laughs> I'm sure that was greeted with admiration. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, mercy and faithfulness. On and on and on and on and on. Okay? This is where he calls them whitewashed sepulchres. Uh, uh, you are white, white, whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. He doesn't have good things to say about these guys, does he? You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? They're hearing this. Okay? So, of course... Well, Jesus warns of, of punishment, and even though these uh, stories, I think, are retrojected back into the Gospels, the Gospel writers have Jesus predict, and I use the word predict in quotation marks, the, the, the punishment, the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay? So they, 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 they phrase it as a prediction, but it, it, it had already happened. So there's, the, there's the, uh, the punishment for failure to change. And so Jesus, as all the other prophets, faces the same... Uh, uh, the, the, he is treated the same. Many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary, seeing what Jesus did, believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? How is this man performing many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. Oh, wouldn't that be too bad? And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation, which of course happened. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. Okay? So, this is his reception. We, we have to kill this guy. we got to get rid of this guy. Okay? It, it's going to be bad for us if we don't. Okay. So, next question. Who is a prophet today? Well, everybody put up your hands because we are all, we are all prophets. Okay? And so how are we? Every Christian is a prophet. How so? We received our prophetic call in baptism. Okay, so when we were anointed with chrism, and I don't remember this because I was two weeks old, okay? <laughs> I, I, sorry, I don't remember. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, has freed you from sin, given you a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and welcomed you into his holy people. He now anoints you with the chrism of salvation as Christ was anointed priest, prophet, and king. So may you live always as a member of his body, sharing everlasting life. So we participate, we share in Christ's threefold mission of priest, prophet, and king. Okay? Uh, prayer, what's the priestly role? To pray. What's the prophetic role? To tell the truth. What is the, uh, the royal role, the kingly role? To serve. To serve others. Okay? Well, we're focusing on the prophetic role. Okay, so as prophets... We have to understand what God wants. I, I already have, have mentioned our call. Our calling, we are, we are already called. We are already called to be prophets in our baptism. And so we have to understand what God wants. We have to understand the new covenant, the fulfillment of the reign of God on earth. Okay? So uh, it, we have to do those things that Jesus called the people of his time to do. And so the reign of God, a few things about the reign of God. First of all, it is about our life here on this earth. The reign of God does not refer to heaven. The reign of God refers to God's sovereignty here on this earth. Okay? Second, that it's for every person. There are no, literally no exceptions to the reign of God. Um, 
The reign of God involves both the work of God and our work. We have a necessary role to play. Okay, We have work to do to bring about the reign of God. The reign of God actually is the restoration of the way God intended the world to be when he created it. What did God intend? God intended for all people to live in unity, to live in peace, and you know, and, 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 and to be happy. And then it got messed up. Okay, but the the world, uh, the, or the reign of God for us today is is the world as God intended it to be at the time of creation, and the world as God still intends it to be. And we're going to see what that means. Um, it is, as, as Jesus said, it is, it is never, the bringing about the reign of God is never, never accomplished by violence. Fighting fire with fire was not the way Jesus acted, and it should not be the way that we as Christians act. And it's, uh, and it's accomplished through the radical love that I discussed when I was talking about Jesus, through healing, the sharing of meals, trusting in God, and treating everyone as an equal. Okay. So that's what God wants. God wants us to be people who live in the reign of God. We model what living in the reign of God looks like. Okay? That's our call. We have to understand the times. We have to understand that in our world, in our society today, that we are falling short of life in the reign of God. That as individuals and as a society, uh, we're, we're, not where we, we're, we're not where we need to be. And we all know that. That's, that's easy. That's, that's obvious. I don't, I don't have to go into much detail about that. The, the world today, I don't think this is what God intends. I mean, there's plenty of good, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's exactly where God wants it to be quite yet. We have, we have a ways to go. Uh, our world today is so divided in the United States, and uh, we have prophets on both sides of arguments, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. How do we... We do. <laughs> we do. You know? and, but the test of the prophet is always if what they predict comes true. It, but you can never tell until it happens. <laughs> but I think, you know, in, in, in this case, we have, uh, we have guidelines to go by. You know, we have Jesus' message to go by to know where we need to be. You know, in terms of division and in terms of, you know, peacemaking and... and all those kinds of things. We're way below the mark right now, aren't we? With well, the, with the divisions and everything else. We it sure doesn't. It doesn't look. It doesn't feel very good, does it? Uh -huh. It doesn't look very good. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with you, Lee. Okay. So it's we understand, and this is where we have to be in our own way, like Greta Thunberg is. We have to call out the truth. So when we see division, we have to be willing to call it out and say, this is not right. When we see uh, you know, the poor and the needy being uh, mistreated, we have to call it out. We have to say, this is not right. You know, when, uh, when we see injustice, we have to say something about it. Because if we don't, then we are somehow complicit with it. That makes sense. To 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 say nothing is to say is is in a way to say oh it's okay. This is the challenge. This is what makes being a prophet hard work. This is hard hard work. Um, okay. And we have to be willing to face the consequences. We have to be willing to risk criticism, rejection, or people just downright ignoring what we say. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lee. I hear, I hear you. Have a good day. Okay. <laughs> Got it, buddy. You know, and then just moving on. So we have to be willing to face uh, rejection and, and criticism. 
you know, outside of that young girl we just saw there, yeah. how does anybody get the the exposure to make your voice heard out of millions and millions of people? That's a great question, and I don't know the answer. I, all I know is this child sat outside the Swedish parliament with a sign. She her just, parents had to let her do that. They did. They, they, they did. Uh, if you ever get a chance, she did a TED Talk in Sweden. She did a TED Talk, and she said, <laughs> it's really revealing. She said, so I am on the uh, spectrum for Asperger's disease, which means I only, sp I, I only know how to tell the truth. I don't know how to lie. And I only speak when I have something that I think is important to say. <laughs> and so I think her parents kind of understood that and said, okay, Greta, this is what you need to do. You go right ahead. And she sat outside the Swedish parliament, and then it just Lost took it. off. I mean, I, I think, too, and this is what gives me so much hope about young people, the Parkland kids after the shootout, yeah. you know, uh, stood up and did not back down when they were criticized, did not back away. But where are they? Now? I think they're still, they're not as high profile as they used to be, but I think they're still <clears throat> active. Quite sure they're still active. So, yeah. And, and I think, you know, I think being heard by millions is not necessarily what we're all called to do. You know, we're not all going to be Greta Thunberg. You know, but we're in our, in our own world, in our own you know, setting, that's what we're called to do. All right, now, so let's take a, a, a more in-depth look at the prophetic call, okay? And especially in the documents of Vatican II, I think everybody here is old enough to have remembered Vatican II. 1962 to 1965, okay? Not? No, and I was raised Protestant, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, but well, you then, heard it. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, you've, you've heard of Vatican II. All right, so here, is, here are the documents of Vatican II. Vatican II met, of course, in Rome, in the Vatican, between 1962 and 1965. The Second Vatican Council was called by Pope John XXIII. He died early on in 1963. And he was succeeded by Pope Paul VI, who continued the council to its conclusion in December 1965. So the uh, Vatican II produced 16 documents, two of which we will take a look at. Okay, And if you're wondering about the authoritativeness of these documents, they have a lot of authority. They do not have the same authority as Scripture. But they have, they carry a lot of weight in the eyes of the church, okay? The words of councils are very, very important. There have only been 21 general councils of the Christian church, Catholic church, over the past 20 centuries, okay? All right. So, first citation from Lumen Gentium. Lumen Gentium, uh, uh, the, the titles to uh, Vatican documents, whether the council or not, usually come from the first words of the document. So, Lumen Gentium, the, the beginning of the dogmatic constitution on the church is, Christ is the light of the nations, the lumen of the gentium, the, the light of the nations, okay? But it is the constitution on the church. This is what it says in number nine, okay, the paragraphs are numbered. Christ instituted this new covenant, remember that, this New Testament, that is to say, in his blood, calling together a people made up of Jew and Gentile, making them one, not according to the flesh, but in the spirit. This was to be the new people of God. For those who believe in Christ, who are reborn, not, not from a perishable, but from an imperishable seed, through the word of the living God, not from the flesh, but from water and the Holy Spirit, are finally established as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a purchased people, who in times past were not a people, but are now, but are now the people of God. This term, people of God, is 
the primary image that Vatican II used to describe the church. Not the buildings, not the institution, but the people. So you and I are the church. All of us in this room are the church, okay? We are the community of the baptized. So with all of our diversity of gender, of class, and education, and social status, and sexual orientation, and race, and ethnicity, and everything else, okay? So the church is not the pope and the bishops, first of all. The church, first of all, is us. It is you and I, okay? Uh, this image of people of God also means that, well, it evokes the people of God from the Old Testament. So the, the people of God in the Old Testament were on pilgrimage. And so we are on pilgrimage just as they were from Egypt to the Promised Land. And, we, and our pilgrimage is not to the, the Promised Land. Our pilgrimage is to God. And so that's the journey, the pilgrimage that we are on. Um, so then I have this quote here. The mission of the people of God, uh, Pope Francis says, this is taken from Pope Francis, is to bring God's hope and salvation to the world, to be a sign of the love of God who calls all to friendship with him. Okay, who calls all. All right, so primary image of the church, people of God. Hey, Mark, before you switch off that, per purchase people to me would sound like the slaves of the old days. Yeah, exactly. And now, are we considering them as part of the chosen people? Uh, a per the, per well, a cho the chosen race, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and then you slip in purchased people. A purchased people. We were, this, this uh, phrase refers to the fact that we were purchased through the blood of, of Christ. Okay, we were redeemed. That's what, you know, that's what uh, purchased means here. We were redeemed. We were saved by the, by the death of Christ, death and resurrection of Christ. All are called to belong to the new people of God. All are called. Wherefore this people, while remaining one and only one, is to be spread throughout the whole world and must exist in all ages, so that the decree of God's will may be fulfilled. In other words, no one is excluded. No one is excluded. The holy people of God shares also in Christ's prophetic office. It spreads abroad a living witness to Him, especially by means of a life of faith and charity, and by offering to God a sacrifice of praise, the tribute of lips which give praise to His name. So, the prophetic office is uh, uh, an office of giving witness. So, what that means is, by our actions, by our words, we bear witness to the, to the teachings of Jesus. We bear witness to the reign of God in the world. That's our prophetic call, to be witnesses, to say, yes, I've heard it, and I believe it, and I live it. Does that make sense? That's what the prophet does. The prophet, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, so, yeah. Laity. Uh, I'll, I'll go through this quickly. The term laity here is understood to mean all the faithful except those in holy orders and those in the state of religious life, especially approved. These faithful are by baptism made one body with Christ and are constituted among the people of God. They are in their own way made sharers in the priestly, prophetical, and kingly functions of Christ. Okay? Just reinforces what I've already said. We're all called. It's too late. We've all been called. <laughs> Can't go back. Now, let's look at uh, uh, another document, um, Gaudium et Spes. Gaudium et Spes is the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, another document from the Second Vatican Council. Gaudium et Spes, the joys and the hopes. This is the very beginning of the document, the joys and the hopes. This little 
sentence here. I think as, as well as any speaks to us about our prophetic call. The joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the people of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Indeed, nothing genuinely human fails to raise an echo in their hearts. For theirs is a community composed of people, men and women. United in Christ, they are led by the Holy Spirit in their journey to the kingdom of their Father. And they have welcomed the news of salvation, which is meant for every person. That is why this community realizes that it is truly linked with mankind and its history by the deepest of bonds. Now I just, you know, this, this little paragraph just speaks to us about our, our call as prophets. First of all, that whatever joys and hopes people feel, especially those who are poor and afflicted, and whatever griefs and anxieties they feel, those are ours. Their joys and hopes are our joys and hopes. We are people of, of, of deep compassion. And when we see the sufferings of others, we're willing to step up and, and A, call it out, and B, do something about it. Does that make sense? Okay, that's, that's, that has to do with our prophetic call. For sacred scripture teaches that man, that humanity, was created, quote, in the image of God. Is capable of knowing and loving his creator and was appointed by him as master of all earthly creatures that he might subdue them and use them to God's glory. And then it quotes Psalm 8. I love Psalm 8. What is man that you should care for him? You have made him little less than the angels. Really, another translation of that is, you have made them little less than a god. And crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him rule over the works of your hands, putting all things under his feet. So, the image of God. This is, uh, I think, the profoundest change in thinking of the church about who we are. Prior to Vatican II, and you, and tell me if you agree, we were pretty much taught that we're, we're sinners who can, can do good things. But we're sinners first. We're sinners first, and, but, but we're capable of doing okay. That's not, what, that's not what Vatican II is saying. Vatican II is saying we are fundamentally, at our core, in our soul, <coughs> good. We are good. Good people who are capable of doing things that are not good. Not bad people who occasionally can do good. That's a, that's a very, very profound difference. We are so good, we are so good that we are made, and this is right from the, the first chapter of Genesis, we are created in the very image of God. So to look at you and you and you and even me is to see somehow the face of God. And so that image of God extends not just to those in this room, but it extends to those in particular who are poor or afflicted in any way. They are the face of God. They are the, made in the image of God. So how dare we not treat them with justice and mercy and love? Does that make sense? Yes. And then, you know, uh, what is man that you should care for him? You have made him little less than a God. You and I are little less than a God. Little less than a God. I am, I am humbled by your presence. <laughs> I am humbled and honored by to be in your presence. But that's what, that's what the church is saying. That's what the church said about every human being in Vatican II. Every human being. Number 24, 
God, who has fatherly concern for everyone, has willed that all people should constitute one family and treat one another in a spirit of brotherhood. For having been created in the image of God, who from one man has created the whole human race and made them live all over the face of the earth, all people are called to one and the same goal, namely God himself. So, our identity is one family, one human family. So those, the, the folks in Iraq and Iran and, and China and the Philippines and Venezuela and, and, and you name it, are our brothers and sisters. Truly, truly our brothers and sisters. So, how do we treat our brothers and sisters? <laughs> you know, how... How are we called to treat our brothers and sisters? We are one human family. And we're all moving toward the same goal, God. We are on this pilgrimage, as they've already said, we're on this pilgrimage to God, together, together. For this reason, love of God and neighbor is the first and greatest commandment. Let me stop right there. Love of God and neighbor is the first and greatest commandment. In reality, it's the only commandment. And so what that means is that love of God and love of neighbor are exactly the same thing. They are exactly the same thing. There is no difference. So if there is any flaw in our love for the neighbor, and only we all have to decide what that flaw may or may not be, if there's any flaw in our love for anyone, any of our brothers and sisters, that is a flaw in our love for God. That's what uh, Isaiah 58 is talking about. Uh, when the Israelites say, well, look, we're doing this fast. We're, we're, we're doing this for you, God. And God says, don't do it for me. Do it for your brothers and sisters. Do it for the needy among you. That's what matters. Because love of God, you know, the, 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 the words of the Old Testament and the words of Jesus say, you know, it, loving God without loving the neighbor is not enough. We, we can tell how we, the, the, the quality of our love for God can be measured, can be absolutely measured based on this by the quality of our love for people. It's, it's, it's beautiful, but it's a big challenge. It is a big challenge. Sacred Scripture, however, teaches us that the love of God cannot be separated from love of neighbor. If there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. It's pretty clear, isn't it? It's, it's, it's not mysterious. It's easy to remember. Love of God and love of neighbor are one and the same. There is no distinction between them. Okay. Everyday human interdependence grows more tightly drawn and spreads by degrees over the whole world. As a result, the common good that is, the sum of those conditions of social life which allow social groups and their individual members relatively thorough and easy access to their own fulfillment, takes, today takes on an increasingly universal complexion and consequently involves rights and duties with respect to the whole human race. Now that's a mouthful. Let me try to un unpack it, okay? <laughs> so... First of all, it talks about interdependence. The world we live in, in the world we live in today, we all depend on each other. Okay? So, the pen Jim is writing with might have been made in China or Mexico, right? And the oil that, the gasoline that I burned to, to drive here today might have been, you know, from the Middle East. And the paper that you're writing on, who knows, you know, so... Uh, the, the world is interdependent. We, 
depend on each other. Why? Because we're one family. We're one human family. So, you know, the world has always been interdependent, but never so much as now. That, you know, our, our means of communication have made us more interdependent, I think, than, than ever before. Okay, now, this is, a, this is an important um, uh, part of our, 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 the message about the prophetic role. It is the common good. The common good. Okay, this is, this is what... Uh, this is what Christians are called to fulfill, the common good. The sum of those conditions of social life, which allows social groups and their individual members relatively thorough and ready access to their own fulfillment. So, what is society, what is the world supposed to look like? The world is supposed to be set up in such a way that each and every individual and each and every, every social group has what they need in order to fulfill themselves, in order to be able to raise a family, in order to be able to do meaningful work, in order to contribute as citizens to society. That's what the common good is. And so the common good sometimes requires each of us to make sacrifices of, from, of ourself and our good for the good of the whole. Does that make sense? That's what the common good is about. It is about those conditions in society that allow all persons the opportunity to flourish, to fulfill themselves. And when that word fulfillment it has a lot of meanings. It, it, it stems all the way from, fulfillment means everything from enough food to eat, a place to live, a job, uh, having respect, being able to participate and express ourselves in society, and being able to worship as, as, as we choose. Those are, that's what fulfillment, that's what human fulfillment is about. Having the opportunity to, to do all of the things that constitute full humanity. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, so that's been very tough to do. Very hard to do, Lee. Very hard to do. And the only thing I would say about that is, how often is it ever tried? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I sometimes wish we would try harder. <laughs> but you're right. It, this, is a, this is a huge challenge. This is a huge challenge. There's so much to deal with here. For the, uh, oops, went the wrong way. At the same time, however, there is growing awareness of the exalted dignity proper to the human person. Since he stands above all things and his rights and duties are universal and inviolable. I'll start there. We have to, you know, the, where, where do we begin? We begin with the individual. And we begin with the uh, absolute dignity of each and every uh, individual. And, and where does that absolute dignity come from? It comes from the fact that we showed up on earth. Because the fact that we showed up here means that we are created by God. Our dignity is in universal and inviolable. It should not be violated. Human dignity should never ever be violated. Why? Because that every human being is a creation of God. How dare we treat someone with disrespect who God respects? Okay? Um, so, you know, and, and I'm going to explain what these rights and duties are. Every person, because of their, their in, in, uh, immense dignity, their absolute dignity, has certain rights, has certain, certain things that they can expect from the world, and certain things that they should be expected to contribute to the world. There's no free lunch. This is not free lunch, okay? All right. Therefore, there must be made available to all everything necessary for leading a life truly human. Leading a life truly human. All, you know, in other words, fulfilling all of those different levels of, of fulfillment, such as food, clothing, and shelter. 
the right to choose a state of life freely and to found a family. The right, notice the word, the right to education, to employment, to a good reputation, to respect, to appropriate information. Boy, do we need that. Uh, <laughs> to activity in accord with the upright norms of one's own, one own conscience, to protection of privacy and rightful freedom even in matters religious. I should probably put this sentence on my wall. You know, this is what every human being on earth has a right, a right to expect. Because these rights are God-given. They're not given to people because we feel good about it or we, de we deem them worthy. These rights are given to, the, to every person because they're here on the earth. It's that simple. It sounds like the perfect, the perfect world. Well, it is. Well, why not dream big? Not. Why not dream big? Dark but constitution. But it's never that way. Even from the time of when... That's right. Before, it's never been. It's never been that way. It's never been yeah. that way. That's but, the goal. But, but the church, yeah, but the yeah. church never the church never gives up hope that it can be that way. And when it is that way, what do we call that? That's the reign of God. That's when God is truly sovereign on the earth. When these things happen, when these things happen, that's when God's sovereignty is fully established on earth. Is that what Thomas More called the utopia, or is that something different? Um, the, I, 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 I don't like to use the word utopia for this because the word utopia, as you know, literally means nowhere. It means no place. And so, <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, the, the church says this is realizable. This is something that we can do. Yeah. Gotcha. Does that make sense? This doesn't exist anywhere. It doesn't exist now. It is, it's, the, it's, the, it's the vision. It's the vision. This is kind of like the vision statement for the church. Doesn't this vision statement presuppose that we all live in harmony? It, it doesn't presuppose it. It calls us to do it. It doesn't assume that we live in harmony, but it says we should live in harmony. And this what, I guess we'll learn more about the challenges of that when you talk about the various religions of the world. We will. We will. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and this, you know, this is where uh, Jesus' words about enemy love and praying for our persecutors comes from, or where, or where it comes into play. But it's, it's, a, it's a good question, Jim. Oh, yes. Coming down to practical and particularly urgent consequences, this council lays stress on reverence for human beings, reverence for persons. Everyone must consider his every neighbor without exception as another self. Taking into account, first of all, his life and the means necessary to living it with dignity. So as not to imitate the rich man who had no concern for the poor man Lazarus. I mean, that, that puts it in pretty plain English, doesn't it? We are to consider every person as another self. What do we want? What do we expect? What do we hope for for ourselves? That's what we should want and hope for and expect for every person on the earth. It's big. It's a big challenge. No doubt. Everybody has something different that they want. Yeah. I, mean, but, I, I understand happiness, and I understand safety, and I understand health. Yeah. But then there's career. And then there's two houses, or big houses, small houses. That's right. So, yeah. Well, yeah, that, you're right, Lee. But you know, it's not so much that everybody should be uh, every, everybody should be a carpenter. It's that everybody should have the ability to choose what they want to be. You see, everybody should have the choice. Not that everybody does the same thing, but that everybody has the same choice. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, in our times, a special obligation binds us to make ourselves the neighbor of every person without exception. There's no, there's no lack of clarity there, is there? And of actively helping him or her when he comes across our path. Whether he be an old person abandoned by all, a foreign laborer unjustly looked down upon, a refugee, a child born of an unlawful union and wrongly suffering for a sin he did not commit, or a hungry person who disturbs our conscience by recalling the voice of the Lord, as long as you did it for one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it for me. Okay? Make ourselves the neighbor of every person without exception. True, all people are not alike from the point of view of very physical power and the diversity of intellectual and moral resources. That speaks to your point, Lee. Nevertheless, with respect to the fundamental rights of the person, every type of discrimination, whether social or cultural, whether based on sex, race, color, social condition, language, or religion, is to be overcome and eradicated as contrary to God's intent. Prejudice has no place. Prejudice has no place in the reign of God. All right. So now we get into some of the specific areas, and I'm going to have to go through these pretty quickly because I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, okay, so the first area in which we, we have the opportunity and the, uh, the, the, the challenge to live prophetically is in the family, okay, where we, we all came from a family. Where many of us had a family. The family is a kind of school of deeper humanity. What a beautiful thing to say about the family. The family is a school. What kind of school? It's the school of deeper humanity. That the family is the place, first and foremost, more than the church, more than the school. The family is the place where everyone learns to not be prejudiced, to look out for the poor, to show respect for every person, to understand the rights of all. That's where this message is learned and taught, first of all. That in, in the family, when we come to understand our deeper humanity, our deeper humanity, our, our ability to love all people, our ability to love without condition, when, you know, when, when we understand that, then we understand what the love of God is. When we understand our own deeper humanity, then we understand who God is. And I would submit this. This begins not so much with the kids. This begins with ourselves. If we can understand our first, our own dignity, our own deeper humanity, then we can give that. As gift, then we can share that and witness to that as, as we, we saw in one of the other slides. Okay? So the family. Oops. Uh, where else? In the economic and social realms, too, the dignity and complete vocation of the human person and the welfare of society as a whole are to be respected and promoted. For humanity, the human person is the source, the center, and the purpose of all economic and social life. Next week I'm going to explore these. That's what I'm going to do the second time. I'm going to explore these in greater depth. So we will hear next week that the human person is the source, the center, and the purpose of economic life. Not profits. Uh, profits, P-R-O-F-I-T-S. <laughs> <laughs> that that, you know, that, that profit and expansion are not the goals uh, of an economy from the point of view of the Christian. That the, the goal of the economy, the focus of the economy, is persons. Is persons. How do economic decisions and economic policies affect persons first? People over profits. And is the church getting... Getting political here, uh, I would say no. 
because the focus of the, of the church's teaching on the economy is not political, it's moral. It's moral. It is fueled by that vision of the human person that, I've already, that we've already seen. Created in the image of God. Possessing rights. Okay? Possessing dignity. That's what, that's what fuels the church's view of the, of the economy. Not whether somebody's a Democrat or a Republican or free market or a socialist. Those, those, labels, uh, those labels don't mean anything to the church. What matters is the human person. How do economic decisions affect people first? Mark, you get the, you get the dysfunction of the first thing that comes to mind is the dysfunctional family. The family, yeah. if, if the family was perfect, and every, every kid you raised was a wonderful Catholic, and every Sunday everybody went and had dinner together, and all the, yeah. and this, but in our society we have dysfunctional families. Oh, we do. And then we talk about free will. He wants us to have free will. And how, as a father with a family trying to raise them right, one kid wants to be here, another kid wants to be there. You have free will, but then what happens to the, the functional family? Well, that's a that's a forty five minute question. But, uh, it, you know, you're you're talking about the ideal versus the reality. Yeah. So, you know, the church holds this up as the ideal, understanding that we, you know, we don't we don't always or maybe we never live up to the ideal, but we're always striving for it. But we're always striving for it in the context of our own families. My family is not the same as yours. Lucky for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Don't bet on it. <laughs> and, and, and if you ask my kids, they would say, gee, Mark, when are you going to start living like this? You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, but this is why I say, Lee, I think it begins with our own awareness of self. Am I living up to my calling? Am I living uh, up to my own human dignity? Am I, you know, am I, do I appreciate myself? Can I, do I love myself as someone created in the image of God? I think it, I think it has to begin there. Because if, if, if I do that, if I can live that way, there's a better chance that my spouse and my kids and my grandkids will, will, will see it and get it. Gee, that's a good way to live. Yeah, I, w I want that. I want that too. Maybe they will and maybe they won't. <laughs> Wait, there are no guarantees, right? And these are the people who are closest to us. We're not talking about people in Afghanistan yet. We're talking about our own flesh and blood. It's tough. Well, first thing that pops into my mind is the impossible dream. You know, mm -hmm. the, the song and the play. Yeah, but that, it, sounds, like, that it, sounds like Thomas More. I mean, it's... <laughs> it's because it's it, it, it's not quixotic. Quixotic means something that's uh, unattainable, noble but unattainable. Catholic Church would always say this is doable. We can't let ourselves off the hook. This is doable. While an, I'll, I'll finish quickly. While an immense number of people still lack the absolute necessities of life, some, even in less advanced areas, live in luxury or squander wealth. Extravagance and wretchedness exist side by side. While a few enjoy the very great power of choice, the majority are deprived of almost all possibility of acting on their own initiative and responsibility, and often subsist in living and working conditions unworthy of the human person. There's a, in other words, there's a huge disparity in our world and in our country between the haves and the have-nots. That, in the eyes of this vision is totally unacceptable. Economic development must remain under man's determination and must not be left to the judgment of a few or groups possessing too much economic power or of the political community alone or of certain more powerful nations. 
we should, we should be building an economy based on the interdependence of nations and with broad participation, not just a few people making all the calls at the top of the pile. Okay? Now, this gets into, th this one here gets into, uh, and I'll, I'll get, go into this in greater depth next week. This gets into the church's view on the ownership of property. I will, I'm going to, I'm warning you, I'm going to bore you to death with this next week because I wrote my doctoral dissertation on this topic. <laughs> so, fasten your seatbelts or, or, or take your no-dos, drink a lot of coffee. God intended the earth with everything contained in it for the use of of all human beings and peoples, not just some, but all. Thus, under the leadership of justice and in the company of charity, here's the key, created goods should be in abundance for all in like manner. No one on this earth should go without what he or she needs in order to fulfill themselves. Whatever the forms of property may be, as adapted to the legitimate institutions, uh, attention must always be paid to the universal destination of earthly goods. That's, that's, a, that's a catch word for the, for the Catholic Church's teaching on property. The universal destination of, of, of earthly goods. What that means, and I'll, I'll explain this in depth next week, is that our right to own things is not absolute. It's relative. Yeah, it's not. It, the American ideal of ownership is absolute. I can acquire as much as I want and do with it whatever I want. The Catholic Church says that's not, that's, that's not their vision of ownership. Their vision of ownership is that the right of all people to have and to use the good things of the earth is takes priority over the right, my right, to own whatever I want. And so in a, in, in a sentence, and I'll leave it here, if I have more than I need, this is, in, in a nutshell, this is what the church says. If I have more than I need, and there's someone who does not have what he or she needs, that belongs to them. It's not mine. <laughs> See, I hope you come back next week. <laughs> hope you come back. We'll have, a, we'll have some lively discussion next week. Well, is socialism or... It is, a, it is a kind of socialism, Lee. Yes, it is. It is a kind, a kind of socialism. It's not a socialism that says that everybody gets two cars and three bedrooms and four coats. It's, that's not it. But it does say that every human being is entitled to a minimum, a basic level of material things. Why? So that they can fulfill the potential that God created in them. They have a right to that. Sounds a little bit like communism, too. Uh, <laughs> maybe. No, 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 not, not really. I mean, okay. all right. It, yeah, hold, hold those thoughts. Okay. A chicken in every pot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, so we can. Okay, so this, uh, uh, our, our prophetic call also in, uh, uh, involves the political community, our lives in the political community. It follows also that political authority, both in the community as such and in the representative bodies of the state, must always be exercised within the limits of the moral order. So our elected officials are always called to act morally first and directed toward the common good, which I've already defined, okay? Um, according to the juridical order legitimately established or due to be established, okay? So, how are elected officials all over the world, how are they expected to act? First of all, they're expected to act morally. Second, their goal as elected legislative uh, officials, uh, elected officials, is to promote the common good. Not to favor one over another, but to promote the common good. Something to keep in mind when we read about this policy question, that policy question. And again, it's not, it's not a, you know, a, a democratic or a republican or a libertarian position. It is the moral position. It's based on that vision of the human person 
and, and, and society the way God intended it to be. It's moral. <coughs> Citizens must cultivate a generous and loyal spirit of patriotism, but without being narrow-minded. This means that they will always direct their attention to the good of the whole human family, united by the different ties which bind together races, people, and nations. So it's not my country right or wrong. It is, yes, I love my country, but... I want my country to, to, to be in harmony with all the countries of the world. Oh, yeah. And now, oh, peace. Wow, it's already seven minutes after. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll just read this and uh, talk about this quickly. This is, the, this is the Christian vision, the Catholic vision of peace. Peace is not merely the absence of war. Nor can it be reduced solely to the maintenance of a balance of power between enemies. All right? So far, so good? Nor is it brought about by dictatorship. Instead, peace is rightly and appropriately called an enterprise of justice. Peace results from that order structured into human society by its divine founder and actualized by men as they thirst after ever greater justice. The order structured into human society by God. In other words, the, the earth that God intended us to live in when God created the earth. That's when we are truly at peace. Okay? Yeah. Well... But since the concrete demands of this common good are constantly changing as time goes on, peace is never attained once and for all, but must be built up ceaselessly. We know that. We know that from experience, right? It's, we're, never, we're never there. As soon as we're there, then something, up pop, something else pops up that we have to deal with. To I don't create think we ever peace. got there. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been there either. Okay, so... Uh, okay. In order to build up peace above all, the causes of discord among men, especially injustice, must be rooted out. Not a few of these causes come from excessive economic inequalities and from putting off the steps needed to remedy them. So they're saying that one of the, the, the major causes of the lack of peace in the world is, is, in, is inequality, is economic inequality. Okay? And that's more than enough yeah. I've given you. Uh, so next week, we're going to look in, in greater depth at some of these areas. The family, economy, uh, uh, property, uh, the political community, war, you know, war and, war and peace. And we're going to look to see what our prophetic call is in those particular areas. So, okay, well, th thank you for, for listening. Nobody wants to throw me away. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Much appreciated. Just turn it off.